Well, I just want to welcome everyone here tonight. My name is Laura Fatimi. I'm the Assistant Director at the Museum. I think we're going to have a really interesting discussion tonight. Mm -hmm. We have Tony Fitzpatrick. Hi. We have two different takes on the art market. We have Richard Polsky, art dealer writer, who's also got a new book out, The Art Profits. And um, we also have some available, and they will, there will be a book signing afterwards as well. The galleries are also going to be open. This is our new building. We've been open about six weeks. And uh, we also have a show, Re Chicago, that is up right now. Tony actually has a piece in the exhibition. And um, I don't know if I need to say much about you, Tony. You're just getting back from New York where you were performing. Um, yeah, well, the, the play was up in New York. And, uh, and you wrote the play. Yeah, and we had a really great time and enjoyed it. And Good to be home. Yeah. yeah. Well, this man is multi-talented, um, visual artist, writer, actor, poet, and. Um, this guy doesn't want to get a regular job. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, welcome to both of you, and let's begin. Thank you. I met Richard uh, 20 years ago at CNM Gallery in uh, Manhattan. It was a Joseph Cornell show up, and. Um, as sometimes happens in nature, you know, lions uh, become friends with lambs, and there was a guy who was not only an art critic, but an art dealer. Uh, for some reason, we became friends, and started working together, and uh, I read all of Richard's books. Um, this one, uh, I, I think it's probably very well known how I feel about how artists, uh, I think can sometimes be uh, maltreated uh, by art dealers and by the art market. Um, but here's a book that uh, takes uh, what I've said and turns it on its ear. Uh, without these art dealers in this book, the conversation wouldn't have gone forward. Um, I mean, one of the things I try to stress is that uh, I wish all art dealers and art professionals and institutional art people were as vigilant as the people that are portrayed in this book. Um, uh, Richard picked very good people. You know, Ivan Karp, John Ullman, Josh Baer, um, Ted Volpe, Louis Meisel, Tony Shafrazi. They've all moved some uh, faction of the, the discourse of art forward. Um, now, for years I've been uh, in this kind of sometimes fruitless argument with art dealers because of the economics uh, of the art market. Standard in the art world is that when we sell something through a dealer, um, a 50% commission is taken. And one of my old jokes is always is that the mob doesn't take 50%. Um, I, I also think that it isn't so much the amount, it is the, the conceit that's put forward that their effort in selling it is equal to our effort in making it. And I won't buy that. Um, I, I think it sets up uh, sometimes in an equitable system. And uh, to, to that, and, and, and Richard's been an art dealer for a very long time, and, and a distinguished one. At the first show of Warhol in San Francisco, the first show of Joseph Cornell in San Francisco. Um, so I, I, I'm not speaking with a piker. I'm speaking with somebody who's intimately familiar with the art market and its workings. So you probably stand a very good chance of seeing me get my ass kicked in the debate tonight, which I know many of you will enjoy. So. Uh, but whatever you do, buy this book. Um, is, is little faith as I have in, in the art market and art dealers specifically. Um, because I think, I think the one thing all the guys in this book have in common is that for the 50% or whatever uh, commission they earn, and a great many of them, when they started, were not taking 50%. Um, they did things for artists that I don't know that dealers do know. I don't know that dealers catalog your every piece of work or frame your work or um, attract institutional attention for your work, which was part of the job of a Sidney Janis or a Betty Parsons or a Leo Castelli. Um, 
there, I don't know that we've ever had one of those in Chicago. So with, with that, I'll let Richard talk a little bit and uh, not monopolize this. Thank you, Tony. So, Show the switchblade. They, they think I made this up. Right. Well, I didn't buy it. It was, it was a gift. <laughs> You know, you don't have to tell it. I don't want to think of it. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a lovely switchblade. It's a, it's an Italian job. It's a, it's a, it, it has a, a, a serpentine blade. Um, uh, it's known in the, the trade, in the outfit, is, is the gut ripper. Uh, it has a serpentine blade to promote blood loss. There you have it. And I'm debating an art dealer, so I thought it better to Grow up. be healed. Yeah. <laughs> well, how's that for an introduction? You got a switchblade? Uh, anyway, I'll tell you. Yeah, there you go. All right. Anyway, my background is I, I got involved in the art business back in 1978, and I moved to San Francisco with the idea of making art. And I had all these big dreams. A show of hands, how many artists are we are here tonight? Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Well, probably, all good ones too, probably, like probably your age is 22, yeah. 23. And, you know, had these dreams of coming out to San Francisco. I was living in Ohio at the time and making art, making sculpture, getting a studio, waiting tables, doing, driving a cab, doing whatever it took to, you know, quote, have that dream happen. And somehow, I, I got involved in becoming an art dealer in an offbeat way. Does anybody know the artist Hundervasser? Hundervasser, the Austrian artist showing hands. Oh, oh, a couple of people do. Hundervasser is kind of a cult figure. He does these paintings. They all have spirals in them. He's Austrian. He's an ecological artist. He designed homes with grass on the roof and trees on the roof. He became a real cult figure, a big deal. Anyway, when I came to California, I ended up living with this crazy woman who um, came out from Ohio with me, but I didn't know her that well. And you know, I was lonely, and I figured this is probably a good idea. She came out, and I didn't realize she was crazy. Uh, she tried to burn her high school down, and they caught her, and all these weird things happened. But I didn't know any of this. Anyway, long story short, I go out for a job interview, and I wasn't hired. It was a gallery at Fisherman's Wharf, and they didn't want to hire me because I knew about art. You can believe that one. They wanted a professional salesman, a closer, somebody who could sell vacuum cleaners. Long story short, I come home, I tell this crazy woman, I don't believe it, I couldn't get, they wouldn't hire me. She goes, well, come on, we're dressed up, let's go downtown, go see some shows. We go downtown, we go past the gallery, Paul, a distinguished art dealer who's in our audience tonight, Paul Klein, would know this person, name's Foster Goldstrom, all right? He has a poster on the door from Underwasser. My friend Peggy says, hey, let's go in here. I love Hunter Vosser, what a great artist. I'm He's like, crazy like me. You know, and I'm like, man, I don't know, it's kind of commercial, you know, I'm, I'm a serious person here, I'm not here to make art, I don't know. And she goes, no, no, let's go in. And we go in, and there's this wacky couple running this place. And I guess we were dressed pretty well, so we looked like we had some money and like we could buy some art. So the wife is showing my friend Peggy some Hunter Vosser prints. And this other guy, Foster's, just starts talking to me. And everybody who came in the gallery, he'd make some wisecrack to. Like, I'll never forget, a woman walked in with a backpack. And he looks at her, he goes, excuse me, honey, you 70s 100 miles north? You know? <laughs> and I, I thought this guy was the funniest thing I've ever, I've ever seen. The upstart of all that is I ended up working for him and learned how to become an art dealer. And I realized by the age of 30, I wasn't a good enough artist to do it as a career. And just as an aside, any of you who are serious about making art, you got to believe in yourself. That's all I'm going to tell you. You better believe you're that good. you got to be realistic about it. You cannot do this as a career. You can do this for your pleasure. You can do this because you, you enjoy it, of course. But the career, you better be all in, in terms of you know, how you feel about the art you're making. So anyway, I learned the profession of art dealer. It's an interesting profession because the art business is unregulated. That means anybody out here can become an art dealer. To, to do nails, to do hair, you need to be licensed. Okay, and I have nothing against beauticians or anything like that or barbers. Obviously, to become an attorney or a doctor, you have to pass pretty serious tests. But to sell you a million dollar painting, uh-huh, 
anyone can do this. Just print up courage, kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true. Uh, all you have to do is find a space, paint the walls white, throw a plant in the corner, hang some pictures, and the public assumes you know art history, you're a good business person, you have ethics, you have a good eye, and so on. Some do, some don't. What's unique? Well, I mean, even artists have to pass the draw stinky thing in the comic books, you know, the, um, I mean, that's part of, part of my issue with art dealers is that one becomes an art dealer the minute they say, I'm an art dealer. Very true. That's totally true. And um, it's also unregulated. And things that lawyers, uh, stockbrokers, doctors would be disbarred for, defrocked for, are perfectly legal in the art world. There is a, uh, an elastic uh, code of ethics. There's, a, there's an ethical slide rule in the art world. That's true. So I decided anyway to write a book which talked about dealers that I admire. Because I admit I don't have a lot of respect for the profession. I think it's a lot, it, it tends to be not even a profession, it tends to be a lifestyle. People go into becoming a gallery owner because they can afford to. There's no money in it. The money is already made in another world, another, you know, your spouse had money. You made money in a different industry. You inherited something. You had a trust fund. Believe me, there's no money in this. Unless you're representing one of the top 20 artists in America. If you're representing like Wayne Tebow or Bryce Martin or Jasper Johns, all right, you're going to see some money. But even someone like Johns, who shows with Matthew Marks in New York, you probably don't know this. You know what percentage Matthew Marks takes? What, Jasper? That's exactly right. Jasper Johns gets 90% when he sells a painting. Well, well Daniel, Daniel 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 Hurst is, is, the, is the guy who's kind of turned this all on its ear. You know, Damien's primary business handler is not a dealer. It's, it's, a, man, a, business manager. Yeah. it's a man named Frank Duncan, <coughs> whose job before handling Damien Hurst was as a London bookmaker. What Frank Dunphy understood was numbers. And at a certain point three years ago, he said to Damien, he said, you own 200 pieces of your work. He goes, you should just take them straight to the marketplace because I know for a fact that Jay Joplin or Larry Gagosian would never imperil their relationship with you trying to eat off your plate for your own property. And that's what he did. And, and something significant happened that artists are going to one day thank Damien Hurst for. Every boutique auctioneer guy in the world, whether they're on the internet or whether they're, you know, Philip Sapuri, got this thought in their head, what if I go right to the artist? What if I deal directly with artists rather than having to kiss Jay Joplin's ass or Larry Gagosian's ass or Barbara Gladstone or whoever. Believe me, you're, you're going to see that. This paradigm is going to change. Mm -hmm. You're going to see artists more have partnerships with business type of people rather than traditional dealers. In the next 20 years, I don't think you're going to see the kind of dealer-artist relationship that seems to be the norm now. Um, Good day. Things are always changing. Well, anyway, what I tried to do, you know, with this was I decided, stop being so cynical, stop being so negative. Try to think a little more about people who have made a difference. Dealers who really got the art, who loved the art, who, who cared. This was their life. It's what they did, what they breathed, what they slept. And I came up with 10 dealers. But I also wanted to talk about 10 different art forms, including some of the forms that get very little attention, like comic book art, um, Native American art, street art, um, Ceramics. What's amazing is that you mentioned comic book art, and in Chicago, this city has spawned some of the best of those. Chris Ware, I think, is yeah. maybe the best artist in Chicago. Um, also, Daniel Klaus, uh, a great many of the really revolutionary comic guys yeah. came from this city. I didn't know that. Um, and and the, the street art, the poster art. Um, the, the chapter on Bill Graham, I mean, there's a whole uh, culture of guys here who do silkscreen for rock and roll shows. Um, 
most notably Steve Walters and Jay Ryan. I mean, that's a very big uh, culture in Chicago. And what, what's interesting is hearing how much of a hand Bill Graham had in it. I always knew of him as uh, the concert promoter, the Fillmore West, and, right. and later the Fillmore East. And, and um, uh, he, he was uh, uh, a, a born hustler. I mean, yeah, just, right. uh, you know, a guy who was born in a uh, occupation camp and uh, probably would have fared very well in the regular art world. Yeah, now this guy was a go-getter. I mean, Graham was the concert promoter, as Tony mentioned, who hit on this idea that to promote the concerts, he'd commission artists in the San Francisco and the Bay Area to design these psychedelic posters. And the interesting thing is these posters were not taken seriously at first. People, you know, they'd, they'd steal them, basically. They'd take them down from telephone poles and bring them in their rooms. But nobody saw them as, as art. But that started to change. And what I tried to do was demonstrate how you get a guy like Bill Graham, just with a little money and a little belief in these artists, was able to serve as a catalyst and push him forward to achieve really, really wonderful things. You know, Larry Gugosi had started out selling yeah. posters. That's right. That's right. I, I remember when Keith Haring was making those wonderful drawings in the subways on the placards, right. people going in and grabbing them. And now you're yeah. seeing them, you know, at auction and, yeah. uh, Well, that's what happens. You know, art forms, you know, what's art, what's, I mean, there are things like, again, we talked about comics. I, I like mm -hmm. that subject, certainly. There's a guy in here, you probably heard of named Stan Lee, who was the head of Marvel Comics. And again, Lee had this vision that he decided, you know, now let's not go with the status quo of Superman and Batman, where the drawing, the quality of the drawing is just so-so, it's mediocre. Let's bring in some people who know a little about perspective, a little about anatomy. And he discovered somebody named Jack Kirby. Kirby is responsible for drawing the Hulk, and, and Steve Ditko. Steve Ditko, who did Spider-Man. John Biscama. That's right. And, uh, All these guys are a great. A host of, of yeah. the finest uh, comic book guys came up through the Marvel, uh, well, they would say the Marvel, uh, the, 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 the Marvel ghetto, because they, they were not paid very much. No, they weren't. Yeah. But the irony is their drawings, the original art, the black and white pen and ink drawings, have become very valuable. And that's what just tends to happen. Dealers are always looking to make markets. There's a market being made as we talk somewhere, I can assure you. Um, one of the funnier, I think, uh, actually, let me tell this one story. This kind of one of the funnier things that happened to me on the way to becoming an art dealer was I tried to look back on my experiences and what formed this interest, what led into wanting to own a gallery someday and work with others. And I do trace it back to how thrilled I was by comic books. When I was probably 16 or 17 years old, I decided I wanted to own a really valuable comic that was drawn by Jack Kirby. And I decided I wanted the first issue of The Incredible Hulk. And at the time, you, you would even tell the, the market was just starting to happen for comic books. Spider-Man 1, probably in 1972, was worth, I'm guessing, $250. Which seemed like a lot of money if you're a teenager in the 70s. You're thinking, how could this be? But it was. So I settled on this idea of getting the first Hulk. But you wanted to find one that was in mid condition. You know, if you were a collector, if you collected stamps, coins, or baseball cards, you knew how important condition was. Not just the object, it had to be pristine. Somehow, there was one comic book dealer in Cleveland where I went to high school. His name was Jim Kovacs. And he was this really nasty guy. He was he was probably about 35. He was kind of hunched over, had a, like a, a newsboy cap. And he's just, you know. He's a guy Harvey Pinker used to fight with all the time. In Cleveland. Yeah. yeah, he knows who this is. Anyway, I saved up some money. I go into a store, and lo and behold, he's got an incredible Hulk number one. And this is in the days when the Hulk was gray, not green. The early issues, Kirby drew him with gray skin. So I see this Hulk, and I'm trying to play it cool, and I'm like, how much, how much do you want for it? And he said $150. I was like, whoa, that's, you know, I mean, it seemed like a lot of money. And I had probably $100 in my pocket. That's about what I could afford to spend. So the guy starts provoking me, and he goes, oh, too much for you? Can't handle it, huh? Maybe you're not ready for Hulk number one. And I'm like, you know, the guy's like challenging my manhood here. <laughs> not ready for Hulk. It's actually not a bad tactic. No, it worked. It worked, you know. Anyway, so I said to the guy, I go, all right, look, I said, I've got $100. 
Um, but I have some other comic books. I don't live that far from here. Would you consider a combination of cash and trade? He goes, well, let's see what you got. So I run home, get the comics, bring them back. He's flipping through them. He goes, have that one, have that one. This is a piece of shit. Um, this is a good one. Need that. You know, Mix a pile. We make a deal. I give him 100 bucks, get the comics. It, that's what, you know, the ones he wants. I'm all happy. I come home, I go, I did it. I got this great comic. A year later, I, I go to college. And you always need money when you go to college. So I figure I'm going to sell it. Even though that wasn't the plan. I figured out, let's see what I can get for it. So I go back there, and he offers me $250 for it. $100 profit. So I did it. And I'm thinking I'm some sort of financial genius. I think you guys know where this is going. You know, I can tell what it looks in real space. Anyway, when I wrote this book and I talked about Jack Kirby and Marvel Comics, I did a little research. And I get, what was it coming for? Yeah, that's, that's where we're going with this. I get something called the Overstreet Price Guide. I look up Hulk 1 in mint condition and $125,000. And um, I'm going, man, all right, that was 30 years ago. But this is what happens. You know, Stan, Stan happens. Lee actually made Kirby make the Hulk green. Because Stan Lee looked through the first couple of books and he thought, Jesus, he looks like a tumor with eyes. You know, it's like, you gotta get some color. That, that's how the Hulk became green. I didn't know that. Yeah. And uh, I, I think it's particularly fascinating with comic books because, and, you know, if you scratch almost any artist, you find, you know, not too deeply beneath the surface of pale cartoonist. I mean, when I was a little boy, I, I loved Dick Tracy. Yeah. And that was uh, what I wanted to draw. I wanted to draw comics. And and, um, and then, you know, because the ADD was so awful, I, I couldn't pay attention to, I'd always want to just draw something new all the time. You know, but, um, you know, comics were definitely kind of my gateway drug into uh, into drawing. Um, and what, what was great is that your parents and teachers hated them. <laughs> Particularly Mad Magazine. They had a particular uh, 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 anathema to Mad because Mad was all about grown-ups are assholes, you know, and and they were right. I mean, was, they had things like stamp answers to stupid questions. Yeah, sure. Don Martin and, and Harvey Kurtzman, these guys who, you know, later on became uh, uh, the heroes of the guys who wrote the first National Lampoon and Saturday Night Live. I mean, a lot of that stuff had its genesis in Mad Magazine. I remember the nuns pulling them away from me all the time. You know, um, I wonder what Mad Magazines are worth. They're probably. They're not as valuable. Yeah, yeah, it's a shame because so much really good art was done in those. Um, art Spiegelman started out in the Yeah, do you, do you guys know the comic Mouse in the US? Yeah, yeah. yeah one of the early graphic novels. And so, winner of the Pulitzer Prize. Right, that's yeah. Right. yeah, absolutely true. One of the things also I did in the book was I wrote about Tony, and that's part of the reason he's here. Is it okay if I tell him? Sure. Some stuff about him. I'll go easy. You wouldn't really tell them anything they don't know. I mean, I've kind of been done to death in this. But anyway, you know. What I try to talk about, there's a chapter on outsider art. Another term being self-taught artists. The people who did it without formal education, but found a way and had original voices. And I describe Tony as, I use the word, I think, paradigm for where I think a lot of the art world is going right now. I think a lot of artists that are being produced be it through art school on their own in America and Europe, God knows where, are setting their own agenda. And by that I mean, it used to be you have to come up with a signature style if you want to be successful. Like you take an artist like Roy Lichtenstein, anytime you saw that cartoon, that comic book imagery with the Bende dots and so on, that was Lichtenstein's territory. You took an artist like Louise Nevelson, Anytime you saw wood, abstract shapes of wood painted all black, well, she was mining that territory. You couldn't do that. That was hers. You just take that out. But what I think is happening now, and Tony's a good example of this, are you've seen a lot of artists who are crossing over into other areas. They're making paintings. 
I tell you that some are directing plays, some are writing books, some are writing poems. The big name being Julian Schnabel, who's directing movies on a very high level. And a lot of these people have not had formal training in the areas they're working in. They're self-taught. They're reading a lot. They're traveling. They're getting out there experiencing life. And that's what's leading them in, in these directions. Well, part of what happened in my own journey, you know, is the best word I can think of is um, by not going through lots of uh, critiques or things like that and kind of being, in the very beginning at least, by myself a lot. I mean, I wasn't really part of an art community. Uh, nobody ever said, well, you can't do that. No, that's not good. Or, um, I, you know, I, there was kind of this unfettered uh, license to kind of do what I wanted, and um, and that helped. I also, at, at the age of 22, 23, 24, never thought I was going to ever do this for a living. So I just did it with uh, all out of and and. The fact that I got a career was really uh, kind of a, a series of happy accidents. I followed a friend in New York and uh, was making drawings on slate boards. And at the time I had a job as a bartender and once in a while somebody from the bar would buy one for, you know, $100 or $150 and I, you know, I thought I'd never work again, you know. Um, but uh, from where I came from in life, uh, we didn't see, culturally we didn't see ourselves as those kind of people. You know, my my father was always stressing to me that uh, you have my union card. I had a union cement job for a while, and uh, <coughs> he'd always make sure that you know if I if I hadn't paid my union dues when I wasn't working, he paid. Them, you know, to make sure I always kept my card and. Um, I never got rid of my union card until I was, what, about 40? Yeah. Because I always thought this could fall apart. You know, this could... Uh... That's not uncommon. Yeah, I mean, I, my, my first show in New York got a, you know, a New York Times review and a lot of, luckily a lot of very, you know, famous movie star types bought my work and then I never did anything other than draw pictures for a living. But I also didn't think, well, this is it. I'm, I'm, I mean, my first uh, feeling with success was utter terror. You know, I thought, this can just go away at any time. And I just started working harder. Uh, well, that's the key. It's, you know, all these artists who you hear about who make it, they're all hard workers. I mean, even yeah, whether you like what they do or not, I mean, they work Warhol hard. worked hard. You know? I mean, everybody yeah. thought Warhol always at Studio 54. And was, no, the guy worked the night away. Like, these guys yeah. work, and even Salvador Dali, one of his great quotes is that no masterpiece was ever created by a lazy artist. And I always thought that's a great comment. It's yeah. so simple. It's, it's true. Uh, you're one of, you know, I, I know what you go through to, to, to do your work, but what you said um, is interesting. There's an artist named Wayne Tebow, I assume some of you know who he is. Considered one of our better living artists, he's 91 now, extremely successful. Um, he taught up until a few years ago at UC Davis, even though the guy was a yeah. millionaire many, many times over. And someone goes, why do you keep teaching? And he's like, well, I enjoy it. But he also mentioned he was concerned. What if this thing just falls apart? What if people don't like my work? What if I have to compromise and make work that I don't want to have to make because it will sell and da-da-da-da-da? So you're never home free, even when you think you're Well, I mean, yeah, and it's, it's, you it's know, hard. for myself, there have been a lot of years where I've made, where I've made a lot more money as an actor than, and, and yeah. a writer and, and as an artist. I mean, uh, when I first started making etchings 20 years ago, well, it kind of blew the whole outsider thing out of the water. You know, everybody was like, well, you're... And I never ever thought of myself as that. I mean, I knew who Picasso was when I was seven. My mother was a po is a poet, and uh, you know we always had books, and, and she was extraordinarily sophisticated. And 
she had a very low opinion of television, so we, we didn't have one in our house until I was about 10 years old. I found out my dad had one in the room to watch the Sox game. <laughs> but my mom thought television was lazy, and, and she thought it was intellectually stunting, and always made sure I had, you know, colored pencils and crayons and stuff like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, I think it goes in part to the way you think about it. I mean, now they're thinking about giving out a doctrine in art history, or not art history, a studio art or something. I, I, don't, I don't really, I don't know. I guess I don't understand how you qualify that. You can't teach it. Yeah, and, and, and truthfully, you, you, I, I don't think you really learn it. I think you intuit it. You would treat it, and, and then eventually you, you kind of become it, you know. Uh, you know, there's an old saying by Truffaut, first, you know, the, the artist does the work, and then the, and then the work becomes the artist. I think oh, that's yeah. kind of part of it, you know. Um, yeah. yes. You know, I mean, I would never tell anybody not to go to school or not to, I would never want to forget anything I ever learned. Um, I mean, I, I still have ideas that I may go to college and try to get a degree in literature. I, I would like to keep learning. Um, but, uh, I, I mean, I think part of my great luck was that I, I've been invited to schools and sat in on the critiquing process. And I find it sometimes really the casual brutality of it to young artists, I found them to be, to, uh, be abusive. You know, I, I remember once at the University of Illinois, there was an uh, older uh, art instructor who just went to town on a couple of younger people. And I, I was a visiting artist, and I, I kind of defended it, you know. And then he pulled me aside afterwards and said, well, you know, we don't contravene each other's opinions. I said, well, I'm sorry, Skippy, you know, you're just <laughs> fucking wrong. You know? <laughs> um, but, but there does seem to be that, you, how many of you uh, go to art school or went to art school? Do you know what I'm talking about when I, when I say that? There, there's, there seems to be this, uh, I think sometimes, and I think people were sensitive uh, when, you, when you're making things, and especially when you're at those really formative periods of making things, I think it can be crushing. You know, particularly if it's somebody maybe you, you really, really admire, I mean, Whenever young kids come to my studio or come to see me, what I always try to do is, is buttress the things verbally that, that I think they're, they're doing really right, you know? I mean, nobody who's ever come to me has ever been, I think, without talent. I mean, I just think, you know, I, I might gently say, maybe you work on your draftsmanship a little bit, or I'll say, you know, I had to work really hard to become a better draftsman. You might want to do that. Um, but, but in the crit process in schools, I've seen instructors be really brutal, you know, and, and, and it's got to be at a certain point for, for younger artists somehow defeating. Now, I'm one of those guys who everything I ever showed my mother, she loved. <laughs> she put up on the refrigerator and, you know, uh, I could do no wrong. My father was a different story. My father referred to it as coloring. You making any money doing the coloring? <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, eventually, before he passed away, he, he kind of got it that it was actually work. But for a long time, he didn't, you know, he said, hey, you're still coloring? They're, they're paying you for that? You know. Um, one time I made a suite of flowers, and he said, uh, he came in and he said, you're going to fuck everything up. I said, what are you talking about? He was, you're the dome and globe guy. Put some skeletons and grabs like fucking spiders in there. He goes, these flowers, he goes, they come to you for misery. He goes, they don't come to you for, for flowers. You're going to fuck the whole thing up. You're not, not going to make money, you know? Um, but I, 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 think, I think everybody's route into where you find yourself at a point where you're making art that uh, can sustain you it, it is different. And I, I don't know that you, when they talk about a career path or this or that, I don't know that there really is one. You know, I think 
The best thing artists uh, learn, perhaps in school, I think, is community. You know, I think the best assets any art community have is each other. You know, I think you, you get nine or ten of you together, you can do something really powerful. You can open galleries. You can uh, create a business for each other. You can impress them. Yeah, exactly. Well, no, that's all good. What would you people like to know about this? You know, in terms of the art business or being an artist or the art market. Questions. Well, Tommy, uh, do you think like? Jay Chaplin, he had something to do with getting Hearst to the point where he could go directly to the auction houses? Do I? Yeah. You know what? I'm going to say no. Well, let everyone have the Jay Chaplin. Jay Chaplin is the director of White Cube. He's been Damien Hearst's dealer for about the last 10 years. Damien was well on his way. He was nominated for the Turner Prize before Jay Chaplin ever represented him. Um, it's not like Jay cultivated this career. Jay found an artist who was very much on the rise, and that's what they do. Um, most of the big dealers, they don't bring a guy up from a seed lane. They pick from the middle of the market. They cherry pick a winning horse. They, um, they, I, I was lucky in that I had a dealer named John Ullman who, when I was very much, very little known, uh, you know, took a chance on me. Um, and uh, made sure everybody knew who I was. Um, got me the, uh, helped get me the, the commission to kind of, you know, seal the deal. I did an album cover for the Neville Brothers and then really never had to do anything but draw pictures again. I didn't know it at the time, but he did. Um, no, I think, I think Jay Joplin has done a very good job of burnishing the reputation of Damien Hirst. Um, I think now, though, that, uh, you know, the minute Hearst did that, the knives were out for him. The next show that he had, which was a paintings that he actually just made himself, um, they cut him to shreds. And, it, and if you saw the, the images of the paintings, they were really not bad paintings at all. They were really pretty good. Um, I disagree with no, no, I, I think they, I, I think the minute, the, the, the minute you fuck up with the two most powerful guys on either side of the Atlantic in the art world, they're going to cut more holes in you than you can bleed out of. <laughs> well, I saw that show. <laughs> did you? Yeah, actually. Now, what did what, you what, 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 Okay, now, wait a minute. Tell me what you didn't like about it. Well, now, here's the deal. Damien Hurst is like an artist. Well, tell me the deal. Tell me why the show wasn't good. He can't paint. Here's the thing. He always had studio assistants do his paintings. He can't <coughs> paint. He doesn't have the, the facility. He tried doing his own paintings. It was to answer this dilemma. What had happened, and you're, you know, you've got the story correct. Mm -hmm. What had happened was Hurst decides to do this. He does a deal with Sotheby's. And I think there were two. They, he gave the art directly to Sotheby's, bypasses Gagosian, cuts his own deal, and instead of giving Gagosian his cut, I don't know if it's 50%, I don't know. No, 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 it's not. They just cut, I know this deal okay. intimately because okay. somebody very close okay. told me it. Well, um, what's the percentage? What is Hearst Catholic shows that Gagosian? Gagosian would have, uh, from, from the deal from his studio, he would have gotten 10%. Joplin would have gotten 10%. Because those pieces belong to Damien. Mm -hmm. Damien decided, fuck you, why should you even get 10%? They belong to me, they're my property. Right. He sat down with both of them and he said, I've made you $50 million, I've made you $100 million. At what point do you guys stop eating off my plate? He said that. And you know what? It's a good Frank Dunphy said. It. Oh, okay, it's manager said this. Yeah, all right. And you know what? It's a good goddamn question. Well, it is a question. All right, so what happens? The stuff goes to auction, and this is in 2008 when Lehman Brothers and, you know, Bear Stearns and the he Wall just, Street thing he was just happening. Beat, he just beat them. He got an eye under the water. Two days later, I still say it was great. shit the bed. Well, anyway, <laughs> Best timing of any artist in, in art history. No shit. Well, I don't know. Who knows? The stars, you know, some, you know, the stars were aligned to this guy. But agree with me that, that someday we're going to thank Damien. Perhaps, but just to, you know, to finish the story, 
he did make, they did gross $200 million in the middle of this financial thing. 208. 208 to be exact. <laughs> um, and a lot of people thought it was rigged. A lot of people thought Hearst bought a lot of that back himself or sent in proxies, you know, to do it. He wasn't standing there with his cow, but he's, he's a little smarter than that. But there was some, and there, the other part was well, a lot of- a lot of it also went at, at its reserve price. Well, that's okay. You know, Dr. Joanna got something like 50 million bucks worth of that shit at the the opening, at the hammer price was, was about what the reserve was. Well, it's still, it may, that may be true, but a sales is sales. Someone is writing a check for all this. A lot of people had speculated on Hearst and bought his work in quantity. A lot of the talk was they were bidding these things up to support their investments. Regardless of what happened, Hearst took a lot of flack from the art world for doing this. A lot of artists like Tony thought it was terrific. A lot of dealers didn't think so. And there were a lot of people just questioning his art in general. Shock. Okay. So long story short, Hearst decides his next show is going to be paintings that he made. He's going to show people he has integrity, he's an authentic artist, he can make art, he can do paintings. I think there were paintings with diamond rings. There, there, and, was, you know, there were skulls and they were diamonds there, and skulls and flowers. I mean, it was like and like photorealism, or you know, a mild form of photorealism. Anyway, you can see he, he just wasn't that good. I mean, I, to my eye, I mean, I've seen a lot of art. I know you've seen. Did anybody a lot of see art. those besides us? Did anybody see those on the net or? Anybody any? see those? What do you What do you guys think? Did you think they were not good or? I mean, I mean, do you really think that he had no idea that a dealer would not like, how they would respond to him? I mean, whether they were good or not, I think that he yeah. was probably pretty aware of how people would respond to him. Well, he took a chance, and I give him credit for having the guts to say, "Hey, I'm going to show you what I can do." But a lot of them were uh, derivative of Francis Bacon's work. Mm -hmm. Right down to the gold frame Bacon used. I mean, you can just see, and the critics had a field day with work like this. Because they, they, they were going to whether he made well, maybe or good maybe paintings not. or bad Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Anyway, you know, look, they look, made it's, it's, it's not that important. Right, look, but, look, what Peter Sheldon calls, yes. this is something I wanted to get into with you. Uh, festivalism. We've got 10 more minutes. Um, <laughs> you know, art fairs, is, 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 I, I think you've been extraordinarily detrimental for artists. Mm -hmm. Even though dealers will tell us this is how we get seen. I mean, honestly, it's, it, it, they're there to service the market. Uh, the, the art market, at a certain point, became a beast unto itself. And art fairs are prom night for dealers and curators in the institutional art world. Artists, honestly, individually, particularly the lion's share of us, the 90% who are in the art world but really maybe don't make a living at it or are represented but not, uh, you know, the 31 flavors that are popular that year. Um, that it can be kind of annihilating for them. And what the art fairs do is kind of uh, change the definition of our work. You know, they cram it all together. It's never, you and I both know, it's never hung to its advantage. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether we intend it to or not, it changes the definition of what we do. You know, I don't do them anymore. You know, I'll do the print fairs because we have control over pretty much how that work is shown. But, you know, your, your bigger art fairs, Freeze, Armory, you know, this circle jerk at the merchandise mark. Um, uh, and, and, and all the wrong people own it. At, at a certain point, I remember when they started in the early 80s, they were excited. It was pre-internet. And we got to see things that we don't only kind of usually seen in magazines and stuff like that. And there was kind of a sense of discovery. And artists were driving the discourse. They were driving the conversation. And now I think we're not. Now I think we are mascots, pygmies, midgets, and chihuahuas. I think we're the paid help. Wow. And, <laughs> you know, I think we have to change it. Good point. Other questions? Um, I 
did not hear you defend Hercules just now. All right. <laughs> All right, let's get it over with and we'll call it after you guys an hour is enough for almost a minute. Okay, here's the deal. Um, there's a lot of resentment among artists, Tony included, who cannot figure out why on earth an artist is taking 50, I should say a dealer is taking 50% of their money from them by exhibiting them. All right. And yeah, that's not what I resent, actually, to be honest with you. What it, well, let me, well, all right. The resentment is that the dealers are not earning their 50%. Thank you. A good dealer, the sort of dealers that I write about in this book, they are profits, they earn their money and then some, and they earn it by being the artist advocate. When they do a show, they do a beautiful announcement. They work their heads off to get curators and critics, people who can make a difference in an artist's career, in to see the show. They work hard to get the work placed in good collections. You know, you could sell 100 paintings, and if they go to, the, you know, Keokuk, Iowa, pick a town. You know, I hope no one's from <laughs> Iowa. Um, no, pick a town. You know, they're never seen again. It's like going in a black hole. But you sell one of Tony's paintings to this guy, Stefan Eblis, here in Chicago. Big name. Suddenly people are at Edlis's place. I assume the guy entertains from time to time and museum trustees come over. And the, you know, it, it rocks people's worlds. They're like, well, I should be checking out how this work. So a good dealer's doing all these things. They're taking ads out in art magazines. They're doing catalogs. They're trying to net the, network the artist into New York with a big gallery. If a dealer is doing all these things, promoting the work to their fullest ability, and doing a good job of it, they earn their 50%. The deal, I mean, okay. there's just no doubt. No question for the crowd. Anybody who's an artist mm -hmm. who's represented by a dealer, mm -hmm. are they doing that for you? Mm -hmm. Artists? With gallery representation? Mm -hmm. Are they doing no, that for you? I'm saying they're their hand. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm aware from they're doing lots of dealers, the dealers are doing less and less. Is that, now, is that yeah, you yeah, you're here? I can't find many dealers who are paying shipping both ways. I can't find dealers in Captain Ellen does a new training for us and other shows. Most don't. I find more dealers not willing to take work on the secondary market because they could make a lesser percentage. And some artists agree with that, but I feel like that's all part of the bitter ball of black. It, it comes down to other stuff too, Paul, like just simply documenting work, taking an ad. Yeah, you know, I, I own a gallery in town. We don't take a percentage from the artists. We print a poster for them, and I have a street crew of kids that go out and put that poster up. We do a mailing, and we take no percentage, you know. Uh, yeah, there's been a number of alternative galleries that publish work books, work catalogs. Exactly. If somebody wants to buy them, they've done the footwork to create the catalog. You know, and a lot of the bigger name galleries aren't doing that. I mean, what, I, what, what I'm saying, what, the point of this conversation for me was to tell you that, that, that artists are, have become much more active in, in, in their own best interests. Well, yeah, you know, or, a, and, 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 that's a, to, yeah. and that's a good thing. I, I'm, I'm saying that the guys that you're writing about, if you notice, you know, Ivan Karp's in his 80s. Yeah. Bill Graham's dead. Yeah. Um, Stanley is probably almost 90. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, these hours. guys, yeah, you're, you're writing about a different generation because when you walk through Chelsea or the Lower East Side of New York or, or some of the, the, the our neighborhoods here, these guys weren't schooled by those dealers. You know, there's a difference between a dealer who's a connoisseur and a dealer who's a merchant. Mm -hmm. God help you if you get a merchant. <laughs> you know? So um, I'm just saying, I, I think we should demand better for ourselves. We demand a lot for ourselves to make, to do what we do. And, you know, I don't have to tell you what you sacrifice to be an artist, you know. Um, uh, and, you know, the best assets we have are each other, you know. I've got, you know, this guy here, Perry Castellino, I rent my new printmaking studio from him. And because he knew that there's just no way financially I could afford to do it with money, because I was hiring, part of my mission was to 
create an economic engine to hire young artists. I could either pay rent or I could create some jobs. He traded me for my etchings for the studio space. So there are people in this community that collect art that have a different kind of currency other than money. And I'm saying if we're a little more reflexive, if we're a little more fluid, if we uh, make sure that we don't suffer from the poverty of the imagination, um, that is a currency unto itself. And that can make this community and all of them, I think, uh, much better. You know, the, the truth is, is you're going to have to be your own best dealer. Oh, I just look at his watch. Do you think the economic downturn has affected? I mean, you. I think it's in some ways it's been good because it's brought the the equitability of this thing we do into high relief. Uh, I think it's uh, it's made us decide um, is is it worth giving away half of my living. Uh, or, you know, what, what, uh, in a lot of towns, representation is a pretty dubious thing. You know, I mean, uh, and artists are definitely afraid of not being with a gallery. You know, I've not had a gallery in Chicago for a long, long time. It's the best thing that ever happened. You know, I have a dealer in New York who I've never had an argument with. He doesn't take 50%, he gets 30. But 30% of me is not a bad ride. My dealer in London gets 35. Um, and you're doing a lot of your own promotion. You really yeah, I mean, look, you know, you know it, ever since the internet, uh, w once it was an internet, I mean, art dealers had to like shit themselves when they saw that. <laughs> it's like all of a sudden you can make a JPEG, you can send that to 600 collectors. And I do. <laughs> you know? And uh, at a certain point, you got to sit down and deal and just decide, well, what do I need you for? What do you bring to this? Yeah. It's better. Now, my dealer in New York, the first show I ever had with him, he sold two my dry clothes at the MoMA. Okay, I know why that guy gets 30%, you know. Um, the, the institutional relationships, I think, are, you know, a very solid argument dealers have. If they have. You know, if, if dealers have institutional relationships. Some dealers walk into institutions and the curators go, oh, God, it's that damn dance. You know? It depends on who they are and, and, and how well they do it. Well, I think another thing you have to be concerned about, too, is if you are represented by a dealer, are they treating all of their artists that they represent equally? Are they giving them the same amount of Oh, God, no. No. But that's fair. Yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah. You're going to treat the people who are selling the best for you the best. And it shouldn't be that way in a way, because the, the other people need more help. Mm -hmm. But it's just the way it is. Yeah, you know what, though? I mean, like, in, in, in all fairness, John Holman always treated me great. I like him. And, and there, he had a lot of people who sold way better than I did. You know? he, he I mean, I brought him a show of portraits of murderers once. And, you know, nobody was in a big you know, honk and hurry to buy those, you know. <laughs> uh, so. I remember Richard Steph. Yeah, yeah. Remember. Hey, we're going to have a big party of three aces after this. It's down on Taylor Street, uh, 1320 West Taylor Street. Um, you know, it's the first home of the Chicago Mafia, so we're going to go and have some uh, very nice beer and pizza and stuff. Welcome to My publisher's paying for the beer, so yeah. you know, take advantage. Yeah. Well, notice, you said, notice you said, notice you said,